All right. What do you think, Monty? Should we rock and roll? Should we give? Let's do it. Let's get her going. What we're going to do today is uh, kind of just pause for a moment. What, what I realized as writing up this email last night, I realized, man, we uh, have had an insane last 18 months. The whole world has had an insane 18 months. And if you have been on LinkedIn, like for the last 10 years, they did like no updates for years, like maybe one thing a year. And it was like the coolest thing since sliced bread. And did you see that list of bullet points in the email? There's like 10 things in this year alone on top of everybody just trying to stay afloat and needing to really dial in their sales and marketing. So I feel like a lot of companies, a lot of people who are in charge of sales and marketing departments, a lot of entrepreneurs, they haven't really had a minute to come up for air and go, oh man, okay, this was like a fire hydrant this year, just barely making it. Maybe you're making it, making tons of money, but you've just been so busy because of that, but you haven't had time to really stop and digest the tools that are available to you on LinkedIn. And then <coughs> think about how can we, how can you apply these, these new features that are out there to your current, you know, sales marketing infrastructure. So what we're going to do today is I, we're actually going to jump right into, um, right into panelist discussion. So no presentation. I am, however, going to share my screen. Just, I, I put together a list of some of the new features that have come out in the last, you know, 12 ish months, just to help jog everyone's memory. This isn't comprehensive. So what I want to do is um, I want to hear first and foremost from the panelists. So I saw Mike and Vivica and Susan and Judy and uh, probably some others that I didn't see just because of the way the videos are, are your headshots are stacked. But I want to hear from, from the panelists here, how have you and your companies who specialize in sales and marketing LinkedIn, how have you been using these new features for yourselves, for your businesses, for your clients to give ideas to everybody here together live and whoever's going to be watching in the future. So um, let's do this. I, I probably over talked. I'll, I'll give everyone a minute. Uh, Monty, you're at the top of my screen. You want to start and we'll kind of just go down the line uh, if for panelists, if, if you've been using something, it's okay if we double, double up on, you know, you do newsletters, I do newsletters. Let's talk about them both, how you're using them, even if there's a little bit different of a slant. So I'll, I'll stop, soapbox down, let's roll. Yeah, sure. I'll add to that too, if you don't mind, is that one thing that I would like to know from everybody, and this is panelists and for the rest of everybody that's on the platform, is what is the one improvement or change that LinkedIn has made that you feel um, has been the best for 2021. Um, <clears throat> one of those for me is that I still do not have is dark mode. <laughs> I don't know why I can't get dark mode. It's like every, everybody has dark mode, but me, but um, uh, I would say um, for your list here, I think the biggest uh, mover and shaker, if you would, for business development and um, being able to connect with people and share the problem that you solve and really develop relationships is events. Um, you know, it has really been a game changer in my mind for company pages. And if you do them right, if you market them right, uh, you can really build up your target audience in a very uh, real way, um, communicating your message, solving problems for them face to face, just like what we're doing here, that builds a tribe of fans around you, if you would, and um, is one of the quickest ways to make LinkedIn effective. So for me, it's been events. Can we, well, let's mix it up a little bit because Laura asked a great question, Monty, while you're on that, since we've been, we've been doing events for, for Abound and for our, a, a good mm -hmm. number of clients is our kind of main funnel driver. Laura mm -hmm. Owen just asked in the chat, how are LinkedIn events better than Facebook events, please? Laura, you're so polite. 
<laughs> I personally don't use Facebook, so um, I wouldn't be able to answer it according to how they differ from Facebook events. One of the great things about LinkedIn events um, is your ability to invite the volume of people that you can on a weekly basis and that, that you can potentially, or that you can just keep them open perpetually as you continue to build those. So it's almost like creating a group in my mind for LinkedIn, but I'll have to let the other panelists speak to Facebook because I don't use it. I can chime in a little bit on, on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a Facebook power user, but I think it depends, Laura, on who you want to invite to the event. So I think sometimes Facebook is absolutely the way to go, for sure. Uh, if your sales and marketing initiative has to do specifically with something that's like B2B, where it's more appropriate for you to have a work conversation with someone else, uh, I think that LinkedIn is, it's just, it's almost like you got an excuse to do it, you know? So if think about it, your typical employee who is maybe mid-level that you want to get into some kind of funnel, bring value to them, of course, if they're at work and they've got Facebook pulled up on their browser and their other, you know, screen over here, their boss is gonna be like, what are you doing on Facebook at work? But if they got LinkedIn, it's like, okay, I get it. It's, you know, there's maybe some value there. So I feel like it's more, it's more appropriate. It's more uh, for the, for the boss. It's more appropriate for the employee. It's more like there's the, the frame of mind where we're here to network and, and do work stuff. You can do an email, uh, you can do a, a registrant export that includes emails. Um, so I, I feel like I feel like those are all really big strengths. It's slightly nuanced from Facebook, but again, uh, I'm not a Facebook power user on events. I think a lot of it is going to come down to who's your audience, honestly. That's that's just my two cents on that. I agree with that. I'd also add that, you know, there's no reason why you can't do both of them. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a ton of people on LinkedIn that will not use Facebook. <laughs> I've, I have done, you know, worked a lot with groups actually on Facebook and, and currently have a group over there. It's very difficult to get people from LinkedIn to go join a group on Facebook, at least in my experience. So if you can use them both, definitely do. All right, other panelists. Let's see, I know Judy, I saw Judy, she has newsletters, uh, anybody? I did, a couple, I did a couple LinkedIn, LinkedIn group, uh, or I'm sorry, LinkedIn events for clients and inviting a thousand people a week was really big. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. huge. It is a thousand. To do that, to do that with individual messages is, is, it would take a long, long time. We had yeah. 8,000 people we invited to this hemp event. Okay. And, uh, Can I ask for a point of confirmation? Because I didn't realize this. I thought it was 1,500 total for the event, but it's actually that many per week that you can invite while the event is open mm -hmm. per each attendee can invite up to 1000 per screen each attendee per but the administrator is 1500 it's uh it has changed i think i think that might have been, may have been before and so for the last uh I don't know, at least 4 months ish each and mike actually is the one that first told me about this cuz i was like oh dang cuz i was we were kind of stopping right about 1000 1500 too each person attending, including the organizer, can invite a thousand first degree per week and it resets on Sunday. Yeah, so even the organizer, because it used to be that all the admins, if it's if you're doing it as a company page, all of the admins could combined do a total of 1500. But you're saying that resets every That's week? Different. That's different now. For yeah. events, yeah. Wow. Okay. I hadn't seen that. That is... Oh. That's amazing. I just stumbled yeah, into it. it. <laughs> you know, I wasn't that's like, Michael, for you. which makes the perpetual event, which I suggested, by the way, <laughs> you sure um, did. Even even more more powerful if you can, because that was kind of my bummer about the whole perpetual event was that well, once you invite your fifteen hundred, you're kind of done as the administrator. But that's <laughs> not the case now. It sounds like awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic, and we're only able to really do that here with us because Mike brought it up and then Crystal, you added to it. So I'm grateful for the collaboration. So it's been very helpful for Abound and for our clients. Thank you. Yeah. And for all of you watching, do it. Anybody else want to chime in on creator mode, newsletters, company page articles, product pages, especially for those of you here who are in SaaS. I'll weekly talk about invite weekly invite limits. Go for it, Mike. 
um, they were a problem at first um, and um, caused us to have to redo all of our operations at first. And, and LinkedIn really clamped down and they seem to have kind of let it out a bit. Um, we're, using, we're using a tool that uses a back end uh, once it once it reaches the um, uh, you're out of you're, you're you've reached your weekly connection limit uses another tool to upload one email address at a time to, to reverse engineer an email address and upload it one at a time to invite people in. Um, one of them was doing three over 300 a week, 350 a week or so. So so you hit the limit on the front door where it says you're done, but the upload, the invite via uh, email address upload still works as far as you want, almost as far as you want to take it. I didn't dare go any further with this. Can call. you, can you um, customize that message though? Normally when you do the oh, import, yeah, you, can't you can't customize the message. That's right. That's right. Okay. So <laughs> we're having to write messages that are sort of mutually <laughs> exclusive or, or uh, um, um, not mutually exclusive, but um, in inclusive whether they got the connection request or not, when people, when people, um, you know, thanks for connecting, you know, maybe you got my message, maybe you didn't. So yep. I think, uh, Mike, you want to share at all how, he, when you said you mixed up your operations, just for everyone here, I know we've talked about it a little bit in the past, but how are you making the most out of your now restricted normal weekly invites? That's a great question. We prioritize the search results. We do the posted in 30 days first. Yep. I, and I do that with twos and threes, twos and threes. I don't care if there are three, if they post. Um, and then we do second level connections. And then we decide if we're going to hit the threes or just move on. In most cases, we just move on. But the P30, I call it P30, the posted in 30 days. I can come back a month or two later after I've loaded up a bunch and there's a bunch more that have posted in 30 days that are new ones, brand new ones. And, and I, I've got a lot of life with that. I have one client who, who targets Christians. She's a worship minister and she coaches other, other Christians and stuff. So we searched on keyword Christian, um, put not Christian in the first name, and then did some other, some other criteria and stuff. And she's knocking it out of the park, just, just, cool. just killing it. Um, and be away and away and above and beyond the weekly invite limit, which is really where we started on this conversation. I mean, 200, mm -hmm. 200 a week. Has anyone here? Uh, so we, we have, we, we'll do similar things sometimes, like when we're bringing on a, a new, uh, like a new person that we're working with and they're just, they have like no connections and we do like a contact import, but otherwise we have up until now stuck within the weekly restriction because there's, there's ways that you can go beyond, but uh, we've we have still made it work for for our clients within the 100 to 130 invites <laughs> per week. I'm curious to hear from everybody else here, just because we have a really diverse um, group of of business owners. Have has the weekly invites thing like kind of submarined what you've been doing? Has it not been a big deal? Uh, you know, because that was like one of the biggest you know, functional changes on LinkedIn in a long time. Anybody, anybody have any experience there, panelists for now? It hasn't affected us at all, but we never were sending the, out that many anyway, because we're mm -hmm. limiting the number, we're, we're focusing, honing in tighter on the target market. But, you know, just while I'm talking, what really has changed for us is all of this stuff that you have listed here, and all of that on-site, on LinkedIn kind of activity has really become more important. In the past, mm -hmm. if you just had a decent profile <laughs> and a couple of posts that said you, what you were all about, that's all we really needed in order to get the connections and start the conversations. But that has significantly changed. Yeah, I think, you know, big picture, LinkedIn's goal is absolutely keep users on the platform and make money. And you can see how they're intentionally doing that. You know, having people live on the platform more, they get more value out of it. They stay on the platform more and then they're going to make more revenue. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I totally agree, Susan. I haven't honestly really even thought about that, but that's totally right on point in my experience. 
to that to that point, Isaac, if I can just jump in and add to the, do, yeah. the mix here. Um, I mean, we're all, <clears throat> well, we, I, I'm kind of waiting to see what the LinkedIn audio rooms are going to look like. And that was one of the things, you know, like you're saying, I mean, we want to keep everybody on LinkedIn and not transform them out. That's, that's LinkedIn's primarily uh, goal, I think, but it's going to be sort of interesting. I mean, I saw so many LinkedIn groups develop over Clubhouse over this past year. And I think what caused a lot of people, including myself, to sort of start shutting down to that is you're jumping around to all these different platforms. And there were some mm -hmm. good conversations on Clubhouse, some really high level conversations. Bringing that into one platform for those of us that sort of you know, live on LinkedIn, I think is going to be really interesting in how people um, leverage that. If it's going to have the same tone or some of the same vibe as Clubhouse or you know, what, what that's going to look like and where you can kind of you know, promote these or position these rather. So yeah. that's more from a marketing sort of, you know, promotional standpoint, positioning standpoint, but it's going to be really yeah. interesting. I mean, as I understand, I say development, I don't know if there's any beta out there or if they've even, uh, you know, given a date for rolling it out, but. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be very interesting. Uh, I'll, we'll see. I've I never, I personally have not, I never really got into clubhouse or like Twitter spaces and stuff. So I, I just feel like for, for me, I get so distracted hearing another conversation going on and I'm just, my time is just so finite. I just, I can't do it, but this definitely got to be spot for, it. I just, I have not lived there. I think it's, I think that will wind up largely being one of those things that LinkedIn jumps on that then turns out to not really work, you know, like when they put together stories and stuff like that, because this is, this is a platform where <clears throat> there's a lot of people that are on the platform but not actively engaged, <clears throat> excuse me, for a large period of time on the platform, you know, and stuff like that is kind of a drop in, be there for, mm -hmm. you know, 20, 30 minutes type deal, you know, an event you can actually, people can actually plan for, I'm going to spend time here at this specific time and I'm going to go do that. Those are kind of pop-up chats, you know, pop-up rooms that, well, you know, I think the fallacy of the clubhouse thing was exactly what Isaac said. You want to be wasting so much time. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see if they can make LinkedIn, if LinkedIn can make it work, but I'd, that'd be one that I'd, I'd be surprised with, honestly. Yeah, true. I mean, it may, maybe it won't even reflect sort of the, the clubhouse uh, way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I mean, the advantage, the advantage obviously is for people that are <laughs> you know, fans are busy, they want to jump in and out, uh, you know, at their leisure and not have that sort of commitment. That's kind of the other side of the events, right? Is you don't have to have that <clears throat> exactly that commitment, but you know, if it's, if it's offered on a regular basis, you can jump in on audio version and, and not, yeah. um, well, we'll see. So that's, that's one mm -hmm. of the things I'm kind of looking at, but. Um, but kind of, I think company pages are going to absolutely take off in 22. <clears throat> I mean, with the events and all the functionality, <clears throat> excuse me, of events, I think that's going to, I think they're really, really focusing heavily on, on company pages. Everybody's starting to pay attention now <laughs> to companies. Yeah, I think the events has been a big win. Yeah. Um, I'll speak I'm to the creator mode a little bit if you want. Um, creator mode has been one of those things that they have started that's been like a huge uh you love it or you hate it type of a deal and um one of the things that i found out with creator mode now that i've had it on for months um i was one of those that turned it on saw my uh my profile views and things just tank turned it off they came back but at one point i went back to it turned it on said okay i'm going to commit to using it and see what you know why they're promoting this as being effective one thing that I did find out with creator mode is that when you post, if you're in creator mode, you actually do need to be posting and at least two times a week or more. And when you do, you have to go to the elliptical, the elliptic and click that and feature it on your profile. So that's what I have found um, to be the most effective and that can and keeps my posts going significantly longer than if I don't feature them. So if you are in creator mode and you're trying to uh, establish whether it's worth it or not, um, make sure you're featuring your posts to your profile page and then um, just write it out for a while, give it some time because my profile views have gone up. I'm, I'm 
continually having more people follow and um, it, it's been a good thing for me. So um, does that go for automated schedule posts too? It doesn't matter if you automate the post, it only matters how much you engage that post after you automate it. So uh, one key thing about post and post reach is when you post it, uh, that first there still is a, a golden hour, if you would, um, where the algorithm kicks into it. If you're getting engagement early, uh, you have to respond early. So if you automate the post and then you'd show up three, four hours later, it's really going to limit the, the reach of your post. <clears throat> yeah, Judy says that CM, or creator mode, sorry, has she forgot about featuring the post and it's been rubbish for her. <laughs> I just, I have... Judy, can you say rubbish live? I just... <laughs> Rubbish. It's rubbish. I hate creator mode. I play with it. I turn it on. I turn it off, and it's just rubbish. <laughs> I just uh, love hearing people from the UK say rubbish. I know it's fantastic. <laughs> well, how do you it, say rubbish? <laughs> we don't say rubbish. We say trash or garbage. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for Doctor Who, I don't think I know what rubbish is. So. Rubbish is fine. Just no aluminium okay. or schedule. Has anyone here been actively using newsletters? I know that kind of was invite only for a while and then suddenly everybody got it and I was getting more invites to newsletters times probably two than I was people wanting to connect. Has anybody mm -hmm. been using it? Yes. Tell us about it, Judy. So, well, I was one of the lucky ones that got it and I had it for a while. And um, so, and I, I think Andy Foote put something, I saw something that he had done about how short posts aren't really working anymore on LinkedIn. And actually the longer posts, like the newsletters is where it's going. And I, I, I kind of agree with that because what newsletters have done is actually increased the, the visibility and the reach of the post. So whenever I do an article, I publish it as a newsletter and it's always got much better engagement on it than my individual posts which aren't newsletters if you like yeah. so but whether that continues remains to be seen because obviously as Monty oh as you said everybody's now launching a newsletter so I think the impact of them may decrease over time mm -hmm. you know I think Judy I think that everybody is rushing for them and maybe two percent are actually going to use them consistently yeah. over the next for two sure. months so they're just trying to grab subscribers while they can, but then they're not going to give any value and people aren't going to care. Have you seen, Judy, like with, with your readers and your subscribers and the stuff that you're publishing, uh, has that like outside of, you know, you, you send it out, what has that turned into? Like, has it started conversations about other things for sales or like, have, you have any thoughts on that? Um. I guess it's, I think for me, it's been like any content type. It has helped create conversations. It's helped to raise my visibility and hence people have then had conversations with me. I can't say that I can directly attribute it to a particular newsletter or a newsletter that I've done, but I think it's all part and parcel of it. Mm -hmm. Are you worried, Judy, about, re about just relying on LinkedIn for your audience? um for for me it is a main audience and I think what we were talking about LinkedIn events before and I'm I love the LinkedIn events on company pages because what I'm doing is getting is using the LinkedIn lead gen forms to then actually get people onto my mailing list and then I'm using that to build my email list and that's been working a treat to be honest yeah. with you yeah, so same. that's essentially that's what's the way that I've been going question Judy with you Judy Hayes. Judy Hayes, just so you know, you're a panelist. You don't need to raise your hand. Oh, oh, oh. I, I just wanted to add something about it um, because I, uh, for a couple of clients, it's come up where, oh, do you want to do a newsletter? And I went through the steps and you can't control who that that invite goes out to because if you say, you know, yes, invite it, it blasts it out to everyone, which explains why we've been inundated with that. Mm. But um, there's a couple of, of problems that I see. I'm not sure how to overcome. One is 
there are some newsletters that I really want to subscribe to, but when something new is published, I don't know, you know, where, where am I getting that notification? Is that controlled by the algorithm? Is it going out to a small group? So that's, that's one problem with it because I'm not gonna intuitively go to somebody's profile to find their newsletter. Um, and the second thing is um, on the, um, what was it? The, uh, I just lost that thought. Um, gosh, a senior moment here, guys, live. <laughs> okay, we'll have, we'll have a magical editor come, come through this later. Yeah, you can't segment it. So in other words, if you say, yes, let my connections know about it, you know, if you got 8,000 connections and they're all different kinds of, of you know, segments, you can't really focus that. And then the third thing, mm -hmm. oh, this is what it was, is after you start opting out of a bunch of them, a pop-up comes up and says, would you like to opt out of mm -hmm. this feature? You know, and most people, if they click that, they don't know to go back to um, it's like following company pages. You know, if you get too right. many and you say no, yeah, and most people are not going to go back and say, oh, I want to get those invites again. So I yeah. think that, you know, the rollout is is a little bit choppy because I think it's a really great tool if it notified people when a new uh, one came out, if you could segment, you know, like pick just like you would invite people to your company page, right? You're not going to invite everyone to follow. Well, maybe you will. Um, but I think just a little more nuanced, but I like the idea that it is allowing people to become, you know, more focused on creating content with a theme, you know, because it makes you name it, it makes you talk about it in terms of what the newsletter is. So, you know, I think it, it's rough around the edges, just like groups and events, you know, it takes a little bit of time. But I think if we give good feedback and really, um, you know, see how we can make it work. Yeah. Do, why you, not? do you guys implement a different strategy for the content of your newsletters as you do or from your company pages or your personal posts? Or is it really just kind of another vehicle, more of the same? I think part of it might be like who you can invite to subscribe. If you're doing it from your company page, that might be more focused because you know people following your company page, you know, for the most part are interested in a company. Um, yeah. Whereas if you do it on your personal profile, then, uh, I mean, that's the first thing, but I, I don't know how to discern on the content, you know, unless, you know, um, you're a solo operator, it's like one and the same, the company, mm -hmm. you know, the, the content, but if you're part of a team, you know, maybe there's a specific area that you focus on, uh, you know, compared to the team, but I, I don't know how to discern that. I'd love to see some metrics on, you know, if they do tell, uh, like with the company page, like who is viewing the newsletter, who, who the viewers, you know, who, who is mm -hmm. engaging with it. Um, Judy maybe. Parsons, does, does that, does LinkedIn give you that info just because you you have been publishing? Is there any metrics that Judy Hayes was just talking about that you can dig into at all? Not that I've seen, just your usual kind of metrics that you get in terms of, you know, views, article views and that kind of stuff. So. Okay. I, uh, Ildiko asked a good question and then I have a follow-up on that. Uh, any recommendations on frequency, like how frequently you should publish? Is it any just thoughts there? I mean, I feel like it'd be harder, hard, honestly, to do more than one a week, but yeah. any, any thoughts? I, I wouldn't do any more than, um, you know, one a week, but I, I only go for monthly because I don't, it's creating the content. So one mm -hmm. a month is what I, what I go for. Mm-hmm. So that means that if you're a writer and you watch this later, Judy needs a writer. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, that awesome. gets into, you know, that begs the question then, you know, how much content is enough? How much is too much? Um, if you're a solopreneur, you know, it, it, it can be really difficult to keep up with posting to a personal profile. Then if you have a company page, getting your company pro, uh, page content out there in addition to doing events, then doing newsletters. So you have to kind of pick and choose, I think, on this platform because there's a lot of different opportunities and ways in which you can get your message out to people. What's going to be the most effective for you and what are you able to do well with? Um, if you're not good at posting long form content, stick with posts, you know, I mean, in, instead of newsletters and if you're not going to commit that's the other thing with newsletters is once you start them you're kind of committing yourself to saying all right i'm going to at least 
produce a large publication once a month. You know, can you can you keep that up or else you lose the opportunity of it? Who knows that you're even publishing it? Because like I said, there's a couple of people that have announced their newsletters and like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. You know, I don't I don't ever see a notification that says, oh, there's a new edition available. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. So there's, I, it's like, I agree. I think it is hit and miss with the notifications. But that's where I think I like using the, um, the the LinkedIn event. So I'll use a LinkedIn event, do that, and then I create an article from it. So, mm -hmm. you know. You know, so. I think that for, for those of you watching now and later, we're really talking about building an email marketing funnel. It's kind of just where this goes, right? The, the thing mm -hmm. that makes me nervous with, any social platform, any platform that I don't own is I don't own it. So LinkedIn could shut down newsletters like you see RIP, RIP on stories. Like I think they'll give it a, a solid go, but what if they don't and they just pull the rug out from underneath you and then you lose all of your subscribers? I would be so angry, but I also want to take advantage of it while it's there. So I'm, I'm almost wondering if what we'll find ourselves doing uh, once this becomes more commonplace is having, you know, like your LinkedIn newsletter is almost like, like a top of funnel entry for your actual email marketing, because I don't ever want to rent my audience from LinkedIn. I want my email subscribers on my email marketing list and my, the tools that I use. So I can do what Judy Hayes was saying, slice them and dice them into segments and be able to give them something that I know they actually appreciate more than just one big blast. So I'm wondering if what will end up happening is we use LinkedIn newsletters as a way to get your initial brand awareness out there. And then within that newsletter, send people to your actual opt-in. And then you can tr like create a rule on your email marketing funnel where it's like if someone opts in from this page, apply this tag, and then you can exclude whoever's a subscriber to your newsletter from your other things so that they're not getting dupes or you can just do dupes. But uh, I, I can see that being a natural progression because then you're taking advantage of the easy awareness and the big audience that's on LinkedIn, but then moving them into something you have more control over as a process and you have to work for it. But I could see that being um, a strategy. Most definitely. I, I, I agree. And I think you always have to have a strategy to move people off platform and by the way, Isaac, you make a great point about we don't own anything, you know, with LinkedIn. However, I recommend that everybody at least quarterly, if not more, to go download all of your connections and all of your data from LinkedIn, because you do own that and you can own that, so to speak. So, um, you know, <clears throat> bottom line is you, you can kind of you can get frozen or they can freeze your account or they can kick you off this platform for things that you don't even know were wrong. Really, nobody's going to go back and review um, all of their policies and know them front and back all the time. So um, and there's even things that they allow on the platform that go against their policies. So I've, I've had um, people that I've talked to that have been had their accounts frozen. They haven't downloaded their data. And it's in a panic. What do I do? You know, so um, at least quarterly go into your settings and download your data. What's up, all, of, all of it. Sorry. Yeah. All of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, everything. Um, yep. what, I know we talked about, we did a whole session on polls, but polls is definitely another mm, yes. innovation yeah, this is. year that, you know, as we, um, and I think Judy, did you just say you do an event and then you write? Um, an article about it. So it's the same way of, of, you know, using this as a trigger for engagement and then creating content around that. So I think that, um, and sure, you could publish it as a newsletter. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, Crystal, thanks for reminding me. Uh, I didn't put LinkedIn Live in there yet either. But I think that Live... Cover Story. Cover Story is another one. Who, who is set up their cover story? If you, oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Mine, if you right. view mine, you'll learn... Two things about me that you wouldn't know unless you viewed that cover story. <laughs> Is that being, you like being the, near the water? It looks yes, lovely you. where you are. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, a water, I'm on the water, literally. <laughs> and there's another thing. I think there's another thing there. It's what, what I'm wearing on my head. Yeah, By it's the, the, way, the hat. Yeah. 
Um, By the way, if you guys didn't catch the mastermind session that we did that where Judy gave her session about polls, absolutely well worth a, the view to go to our YouTube channel and catch that episode. It was absolutely fantastic. And, it really and while, was. While, while, since I'm a panelist and I give a shameless plug, look people, it's out. Hey! hey. 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 So yeah, and it's, it's substantial. Ooh. Great job, Judy. Anyway. Great job. That's all. Great job, proud of you. Vivica, what, what, you, right. can, you can just chime in, Vivica, you're a panelist. You're like a boss. Yes, yes, I know. I, know. I didn't want to jump in interrupting him, but um, and maybe I'm jumping ahead to the, the product pages, but I've seen an awful lot of people. I mean, I think typically and traditionally we're associating product pages and I'm jumping around a bit, but you know, with B2B and SaaS and that kind of thing, but I've seen these in addition to sort of e-commerce, I've seen them being used to highlight sort of downloadable you know, lead magnets or content. And so when you, when you were talking just a minute ago about top of funnel, I mean, that might, in sort of, you know, being a little bit anxious about having your entire audience on LinkedIn, how do we, how do we move them, you know, uh, respectfully off the platform and, and give them enough content to, to be enticed to do so. But that's how I've seen a few really clever um, product pages being used, actually not just for that e-commerce or product, product or SaaS uh, aspect. So people are getting kind of clever about the product pages too. Obviously another channel. Vivica, quick design. question. Is LinkedIn yeah. approving all products still at this point or have they stopped I doing that? No, I don't, you know, for a client, we tried this and um, actually she did get approved, but I don't know if they're doing that just sort of across the board. If they're just automatically approving. I think they're still evaluating, you know, what, what gets approved. And I'm not, I would think the sure. creative, those who are using them create, because I actually switched because I don't think it's fair that not all pages can have products. Um, I switched my my industry to internet and that's what allows you to have products. But mm. because they said you have they have to approve them, I haven't bothered even, you know, trying to put one in there because I'm technically a service or training company. So yeah. I was just kind of curious if if you've seen if they're still going through an approval process on the products if they, you're they seeing creative use. Yeah, they were about a month ago. I don't I don't know right at this moment, to be quite honest. But uh, I tried an ebook. I tried to put an ebook as a product uh -huh. and it didn't get approved. How long ago, Judy? <clears throat> it was about two months ago. Okay. So it's still up. early, early yeah. on. So they always tend to loosen things up after a while because they don't want to keep up with it. So that's kind of what I'm trying to, I'm hoping exactly. will happen. Yeah. Um, that could be really fun. One other thing to add is what about the advanced metrics for company pages, which include like the team engagement, that kind of stuff. Um, so you can see who's active. I think that was a new feature brought in was really getting some, some more um, in-depth um, um, analytics on company pages. Right. And there's also uh, the My Company. Yeah. In pages. Yeah, and this way you could see like who, you know, what's the, you know, it, it was just good analytics. I wish they would have it on, on the profile. That would be really cool. Um, and then what about um, if it was this year, was it the audio? Um, maybe that's on the mobile, um, you know, where you could record yourself like a selfie video. Maybe advanced messaging features could be because I know desktop has some and, and uh, or what about the other one, the, the um, sales navigator out of office reply? which I know oh, some yeah. people have used that creatively to, you know, yeah, as an autoresponder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I'm using that as well. Yeah. To get people up. It's good. Yeah. And then my uh, video meetings on platform. Yeah. Video meetings is another one. Yeah. Um, hmm. So let, let's, uh, we've got about 15 minutes here. Any other advice from panelists on how you are actively using these new things that are available to businesses to grow your business or for your clients. And then after about two minutes here, we're going to move into more open Q and A and then we'll get to you, Dave. Thanks for your patience. Silent mode. <laughs> Silent mode. Silent mode. We, we I have think that the um, company pages, um, the company page articles, are also very well. It gives companies an opportunity to repurpose their website blogs. 
um, and to have another resource out there. So um, don't forget those. Um, when you do write them, don't just copy your blog from your website and then drop it on LinkedIn. It creates duplicate content um, in search. Because, Love those glasses. Um, Love those glasses. Thank you. The, um, what, so Google will actually, the only thing that Google tracks from LinkedIn are articles. So you can get a ton of reach and stuff out there if, you, if you're using um, the right SEO strategies with your articles from your company page. Just make sure you're not, you're, make sure you're repurposing that content from your website and not just copying it straight over. Uh, one last thing on the on the product, uh, the products on company pages and reviews. So we we work with a few companies that have a SaaS product, and so they're eligible for for that. I think that what we've discovered is it's so important to make sure that you get reviews, good reviews, right away. So if if you are an admin of a company page, and you're doing anything on LinkedIn, you've got the product. Find that you're the users who love, who you know it's going to be an easy five-star, invite them, ask them to give it a review. That's going to set the tone because what happens is as, as your sales team is going out and doing stuff on LinkedIn or your company page is doing content, people meander to your company page and they, they check you out. And if they make their way to the product page, I mean, it's just like any other product with reviews. It's very helpful because if they're going to be persuaded by five stars, and they're on LinkedIn, they're going to either have the opportunity to take their route where they go to the company page and they see that proof, that social proof there, or they're going to have to go through, click view website, find some reviews on your website that aren't, you know, you uploaded it yourself to your website and have to Google the company page or the, the business to see what the reviews are or whatever, TechCrunch. And so it's, it's an easy, it's hard to get, but it's, once it's there, it's an easy win to have the product reviews. So if you have access to that, I, my advice would be to make it major priority to get those reviews. Okay, let's move into open Q and A just because we only have a few minutes here, and we're actually gonna we're gonna not hit how sales and marketing landscape has changed in the last eighteen months. Maybe that'd be something to talk about next week. We'll see. All right, David, you've been so patient, uh, and for everybody, if you want to drop something in the chat, you can do that, or you can do raise your hand. I see you, Bez, as well. And then what happens when you push raise hand in Zoom, it'll put you to the top so I can see who is next. So David, what is your question? If we can keep it to 30 seconds-ish just so that we have time for everybody, that would be great. Thanks. Cool. Uh, quick. Uh, is there a comprehensive list of how to exploit these features and the other features in LinkedIn that's relatively current? A, a list of how to exploit what you know, your book the is there i mean besides going to obviously about social and going through all the videos uh and trying to find all these things you put together this list and i assume that there are more i know there are more features to linkedin than this what could you know is there some place that i could go to to read about all of these things and see how i could use them in different ways depending on my company's situation off the top of my head i I don't have an answer for you, David. Uh, anybody else know of a, of a comprehensive way to uh, a resource that has all these things unfolded? I mean, we could maybe have our team write something out, but I don't know. I, anything, I have David. seen lots and lots of strategy posts and articles and stuff like that, but generally a strategy is going to be, is, is not going to be so generally applicable. Uh, the, the other thing that I would ask is since this is sort of pending uh, is uh, You've talked about backing up and, and being sure that you can go on with whatever your efforts are under LinkedIn with if they pull the different types of features or whatever, or you get pulled at all, like you could on Facebook or something like that. Um, there's two, two sides to that. One is along with the use plan would be this, well, what do I do if I don't have this anymore, right? In other words, what happens if stories don't, don't work anymore? What else could I then do? And the other one is a, a sort of odd exploit, and that's this. If something like stories or come, you know, something goes away, there could also be an, uh, an exploit of what you would do to overtake your competition if they're using that feature. Yeah. So, so if something, if polls went away or, you know, something else went away, you, you, you might have to think about, well, what do I do, one? 
But two is, well, what could I do that would actually be even more advantageous because somebody else is sort of SOL for this feature as well? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. I don't have any anywhere I could send you though, David. You might have to just cook that up and then uh, use it to your advantage. Sounds Bez. like a great resource to create for sure. Yeah. Bez, what's up? Um, real quick, uh, just list, you know, great conversation, Isaac. Um, I think of, uh, we were briefly talking about voice, you know, Clubhouse, Twitter spaces and uh, LinkedIn voice or whatever they're gonna call it that may come out. Um, you know, in many of us in on LinkedIn, we do things intention, uh, outreach that's intentional, right? But um, sometimes we're trying to figure out, hey, how can we, you know, uh, get people to follow us and whatnot. Um, sometimes we need to flip the question and ask, how can we serve our community? And how can we create community? And I think the, uh, the voice apps that are out there, like Twitter and Clubhouse are two of the stronger ones. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to LinkedIn, is that it's a great uh, way to develop community. And Vivica, I think you mentioned a lot of great LinkedIn rooms. Well, do you remember Bobby Umar on, Link on Clubhouse? He developed, he just lined up speakers, gave, gave, gave. He, and to Monty's point, he took those people off the platform, 30,000 of them, I think. And now he, he drives them back to Clubhouse, but he's got them to his website. So, you know, how do you reverse engineer that to get a super following like that? That's like, oh, I got to go to Bobby Umar's room. I mean, I, that I can remember his name, that I can remember when I get Isaac's two minute email and I say, oh, that's my buddy Isaac versus, oh, that's that stranger Isaac. You know, these are things right you know it's like i look forward to I, uh, isaac's two you know two minute tip email i do so anyway those are my thoughts let me know when you hit the end of the campaign biz <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's good that's good advice good insight and it's definitely worth considering for everyone here who it's your responsibility to do sales marketing either for yourself or for the company that you work for you do have to keep that big that big journey of a user in mind and absolutely need to get them off of a platform to something that you own and create a, create a plan absolutely william what's your question oh i think you might be muted can you hear me now yeah i sure can we okay, good. Uh, it has to do with weekly invite limits. I was consistently getting the notices that I was approaching it and then had subsequently reached it. But for the last, I'm going to say three or four weeks, uh, I haven't seen those notifications and I've sent out darn near 200 invites a week. So it looks like there's been a sudden um, change with respect to the invite limits. Have others noticed the same change within the past few weeks? Yeah, this, uh, Mike had mentioned that where when they first started real started putting that restriction on, it was like a flat 100 for everyone, and then it mm -hmm. seemed like it was you know we saw like 115, 120, 130, kind of varies. I don't know what I don't know what the cap is, but yeah, it does it does seem like it's not a firm 100 anymore. I don't know if there's a variable where they look at your acceptance rates and then give you more if you have higher like a credit-based system, there's no, I've not heard of any firm information on that, but yeah, we've, we've observed that as well, where it's, you can go above a hundo. And anybody else on that? No? All right. Any other questions? Uh, there was one not so related to this, but with GDPR, I saw, and it might've got addressed in the chat, uh, yeah, with GDPR, if, if you're out of the U.S. especially, you may not e auto-opt a connection into an email marketing uh, program without their consent because you are connected. That is, I mean, to my knowledge, I've had a discussion with someone in the U.K. who had 
legal counsel on that. And that was one thing that they had said, but I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, of course, but I would just be wary of, of doing that without their permission. You can ask them like, Hey, can I, can I add you to this? And if they say yes, then, then you're good. But so Isaac, Denise was saying that you can opt people into marketing if you are actually connected on LinkedIn, that she'd learned that. It does vary cool. by country. Oh yeah. That might be it as well. Yeah. I, I don't want to give out any firm advice. Check it out. <laughs> Check it out. Cause if you get in trouble, I don't want to get called to court. <laughs> yep. All right. Any other questions while we're here live now is your chance. Pete. Um, hey, so on the GDPR, we have a GDPR person on staff and the ruling, at least for the UK and Europe, is that if, if you're a connection and there is a reason that that person would want to buy your product, in other words, a reasonable person to say, yes, that's a good prospect, then you can send them the material and it, with it having an opt out on it. Individually, so it, but can you slap them on a mass email list? Um, you probably would have to be careful of that because yeah. again, the, the person, you, uh, a person would have to say, yes, that person would fit into your prospects. Yeah. So I think, I think there's a delineation between a sales email marketing or a sales email funnel and a marketing email funnel. And just to bring some, some industry language here, clarity, like your connection on LinkedIn, someone you have a conversation and they say like, yes, like, please send, I, I'm interested in like, you can send me an email, then you can add them to an email, even automated email mm -hmm. sequence just to, to book the meeting or more info yep. to book a thing. There is a difference though, between that and email marketing, which is where there has not been that one-on-one -on -one engagement. There's not been that, that opt-in in any way, shape or form. And you'll even find with your email providers that they make that distinction as well. Like even in HubSpot, there's the sales email sequences, and then there's the marketing. And the marketing mm -hmm. usually has required the opt out. And so I, I do think that that there's a difference there. I don't know what it is, but Pete, that might be part of it where you know someone can say yes, you're connected, and they say yes, some way, shape, or form. There's been that consent some way, versus you're connected, but you've there's no conversation no engagement you're just connected adding them to like a, a newsletter just because that's like you know the extreme just because you have the connection just right. because you have the connection i i think that's where it gets a little bit dark a little bit on the gray end and just for everyone to be mindful of that i get those all the time i took my email off of my let people see my email on linkedin because i got sick of getting added to people's newsletters without my consent so right. mary fane brand is here hey I didn't see Hi. you jump in. Hey there. Yeah, I jumped You've in. Been... I had my show, but I was like, I wanted to jump in and see what's going on. Sounds like a very uh, in-depth conversation today. It is. <laughs> well, we've got about three minutes left to blow Mary's mind. Any <laughs> any final any final questions before we wrap it up? Now is your time. Mary, you scared I, I, everyone. I, I got something real quick. No, Bez, you only get one. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, all the things you talked about, newsletters and all, all of these other features with uh, LinkedIn, I believe that the voice feature is something that can help tie all those things together really nice to help you develop a community. So I think that's that's something to pay attention to. You know, I don't think LinkedIn voice, when they roll that out, will go away. I think it'll, it'll probably be stronger than groups. I mean, groups suck on LinkedIn, yet they're still there, right? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I think that the the idea of group as a standalone product feature is, you know, not getting a lot of attention, but the idea of people acting in a group has not gone away, but they've said, you know, let's have employees are like their own group. Let's have them function as a group on the company page. So let's give them the my company area. Let's have X, Y, and Z, whatever it is. But I, I think the concept isn't going to go away because people want to engage with people who they mm -hmm. are, who they like, but as a standalone feature groups. Yeah, it's totally. I also think it's entirely what LinkedIn decides to support and drive. 
You know, I mean, if they, whatever they want to promote, they do look at polls. You know, they I just did a poll this morning and it just like random time, random topic. And I was like, Oh, people are actually looking at it. I just wanted yeah. to see our polls still working. Huh? Actually they are. <laughs> yeah. Actually they are three months later. They're still hot. <laughs> All right. Well, we are on the hour. Everyone, I want to thank you for your time, especially panelists. I know you all are very busy running your own businesses and thanks for chiming in and bringing value. And uh, everybody who is here asking questions, appreciate you very much. We'll see you next week. We might do part two where we talk about how the sales marketing landscape has changed in the last you know, 18 months because it has. <laughs> so possibly unless someone sends me another, you know, earth shattering better idea i'm always open to be flexible so we'll see you next week